Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's great to see, uh, I don't know, over 500 people in a room excited about uh, talking about biomass. Um, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's also exciting to be in the near north. Uh, I think people in Toronto think that North Bay is, is far north, but uh, for someone who comes from a small town in northern Alberta, same latitude as the southern tip of James Bay, uh, North Bay is basically subtropical for us. Um, I'm going to try to keep it uh, fairly quick today. Um, carbon is a, is a big subject. It's tough to treat in about 15 minutes, but I'll try to focus in on some of the things that are probably most important and most relevant to this audience here. I'll start by just giving a quick background on Blue Source and then focus in on, on four or five things that I think are really important for this, this audience to really understand. Uh, a little bit about us. Um, in a nutshell, what we do is we help ensure that projects that reduce uh, significant quantities of greenhouse gases actually happen. And we do that by providing a range of services from uh, initial assessment, feasibility, proper documentation, and finally marketing the actual reductions that occur and getting our project development partners actually paid for doing the right thing, which is essentially reducing greenhouse gases. Um, we have offices all across North America. We're probably one of the largest players in the carbon market in North America. It is, it is our sole focus. Um, and we have work, and we do work, across a number of different project types, including forestry, uh, which I won't talk a lot about today. I'm going to focus more on biomass energy. But if you are in that sector, if you're doing any work around avoided deforestation, improved forest management, um, uh, or um, uh, afforestation, please come see me. Um, a quick additional note about us. Um, we do have a half billion dollar fund to invest in large greenhouse gas reduction projects. So if you are looking mo for money to uh, fund a project, please come see me. We're happy to help. Okay, so get, cutting right to the chase. So what's actually happening with carbon? I think for anyone who watches the news, um, you're going to see it. You're probably going to see stories every day now for the next probably two months around Copenhagen. You're going to hear about climate agreements that are happening. What's it all mean um, to you? Well, the most important thing to understand is that carbon markets are essentially synthetic. And what I mean by that is that they essentially rely on policy. You need a government or someone to say that carbon emissions have a price. And provided there is a strong enough price, that's what essentially allows the market to develop, essentially putting a price on carbon. So there are three different things that are, that are happening that are relevant to Ontario. The first is a global process. There are uh, negotiations leading up to key talks in Copenhagen in mid-December, which will in large part decide what will happen globally. Will we in fact have a global price on carbon? I would uh, probably venture to say that it is possible that agreement will be reached. It's also possible that agreement will not be reached. However, we remain optimistic that some, so some sort of global deal will emerge, if not in December, probably within six months after that, which is very good. You've also probably seen a lot of stuff happening in the U.S. There's a lot of announcements. There is a very important bill going through the U.S. Senate. We expect that there is a chance that the U.S. will be in a position by Copenhagen to actually have a bill ready to be <clears throat> passed to a vote in the Senate. And that's very important because, as we've seen here in Canada, our, our federal government has been very reluctant to act on carbon. They've been waiting to see what happens in the U.S. So that is very encouraging as well. Um, there's also a lot happening at the state or provincial or a subnational level in both Canada and the U.S. Um, I'm just going to focus in on the most important part for Ontario. Ontario and Quebec are part of what's called the Western Climate Initiative. What this is is a grouping of, uh, I believe it's four, four provinces and seven states, uh, including actually a couple of Mexican states as well, who are in the lack of, I guess, federal leadership on this file over the past number of years, decided to do something on their own. The WCI is slated to start in 2012. That's assuming that a national program doesn't come into place before then. Um, so the good news there is if something doesn't happen 
either at a national level in Canada, at a bilateral level between Canada and the United States, or at a global level, there will be a market for carbon in Ontario by 2012, which is very exciting. Um, there are also a number of voluntary initiatives and voluntary programs, um, and those have been important in, in getting certain projects off the ground across the country. Unfortunately, they just don't provide enough volume demand and price support to really stimulate massive investment in the area. You really need the regulated markets for that to happen. In terms of where projects are actually, actually happening in Canada, um, I think it's probably important to note that Alberta probably takes you know, a lot of heat around greenhouse gases um, in the country, and some of it is, is rightly deserved. However, when it comes to carbon markets, Alberta is really one of the only jurisdictions that has put a regulated framework in place to manage greenhouse gases. And that meant that that's meant that it's created a robust market for greenhouse gas reduction projects in Alberta. We've been heavily involved in that process. We've developed 22 of the 25 protocols for quantifying those reductions in Alberta. Uh, in 2007, approximately 1 million offsets at a range of between nine and, and basically 14 or 15 dollars per ton were traded. Last year it was about 2.7 million tons and Blue Source uh, was involved in about a third of those, those tons. You're seeing some activity in BC. BC is ramping up. The province there has put in place a goal to uh, basically be carbon neutral within its own operations and that stimulated some additional project development. In Ontario, I think uh, it's been very exciting for us us here watching Ontario. Ontario should be applauded for all the great work it's doing on renewable energy. I think the FIT program and the Green Energy Act is, is, is world class and I think that's very exciting. What we would love to see is, is a similar level of commitment to the carbon market. And what I mean by that is, is there are some subtle differences. Um, Ontario has indicated that it wants to be a leader in getting an offset system and by that I mean an opportunity or a mechanism for projects and people who reduce greenhouse gases to essentially get paid for those reductions. They've indicated that they want to be first um, and so we remain optimistic that that's going to happen and by first I think we hope we'll see something early next year um, but it still remains to be seen. There are a couple storm clouds related to carbon in Ontario. One of them being uh, a recent um, draft regulations that were released I think two weeks ago having to do with greenhouse gas emissions reporting. What this is is for um, in large emitters of greenhouse gases in Ontario who emit over 25,000 tons starting next year they will have to start reporting officially their, their emissions. Um, as part of those draft regulations the government indic indicated a limit of 15,000 tons so these emitters can reduce their emissions by up to 15,000 tons through the use of biomass energy. But it's, the regulations seem to cap. We're still trying to get an understanding of what this means, but this is of concern specifically to this industry. And I think for those of you who are involved at, a, at an association level, it's something that should be really looked into um, because you know, no other jurisdiction that we've seen has imposed these types of, of caps on biomass. And, and we hope that that, um, that that won't be the case here. The second is, the FIT program and the OPA standard offer contracts, um, you know, those are, have been amazing programs and again the government should be lauded for putting those in place. Um, there are a few uh, issues though as it relates to biomass energy. <clears throat> biomass energy, when compared to wind for example, reduces gases in a very obvious way, that being um, by essentially replacing energy from the grid that's coming from fossil fuel sources. There's a very direct reduction there. But biomass also, in certain cases, also reduces greenhouse gases through uh, methane avoidance. If, for example, biomass was destined to go to landfill, or if it was going to decompose in a way that would create methane, there's a very important component there. And in certain biomass energy projects, the methane avoidance component can produce up to half, or I should turn that around, double the emission reductions associated with the project. We believe that the FIT program or the, the standard offer programs 
maybe don't value that enough, and we'd love to see the opportunity for project developers to hold on to their attributes. As it stands right now, if you sign a, a standard offer contract or a contract with the OPA, typically they claim all of the reductions associated with your project. So just something to, uh, to keep in mind. Oops, sorry. So why are offsets relevant, I think, to this room? And there's a, there's a few very, very important reasons. And just to maybe clarify, when I'm talking about offsets, what I'm basically talking about are, are the credits or the units of greenhouse gas reductions that we trade. And that currency is what allows people to get paid for reductions. And the first and the most important reason why biomass is relevant is that biomass is essentially considered to be part of the short carbon cycle. And what I mean by that is that biomass emissions are considered from the combustion of biomass, sorry, are considered to be carbon neutral. So when compared to fossil fuels, there's a very clear advantage, and that's very important. It puts biomass at a competitive advantage, provided you're in a system where there is a price on carbon. Um, so switching from fossil fuels to biomass energy in a carbon-constrained world <clears throat> has an advantage because you're, you're producing reductions. And provided someone's paying you for those reductions, it can obviously significantly improve the economics of a, of a biomass energy project. And I think that's it's critically important, especially right now. Natural gas prices are depressed. The price signals, in many cases, just aren't there for doing a fuel switch project to biomass, just on the economics of the fuel alone. So if project developers can get paid for the greenhouse gas reductions that they're generating, it's, it's, it's an added boost that really, really helps. The, I think the last um, point where it's really relevant, and probably especially to this crowd, is that I think the comment was made earlier around, you know, Ontario or Northern Ontario being the Saudi Arabia for biomass. You know, if you look at Saudi Arabia, you know, in their case, they're not generating electricity or producing heat or steam burning biomass. They're using what they have, and what they have are fossil fuels. So by using biomass locally, you know, what you're doing is essentially keeping money within communities um, rather than sending that money elsewhere to fossil fuel industries. So I think that's a very important point. And I think it's, it's, it should be a key driver and that this is a way, biomass energy is a way of keeping money within Northern Ontario communities. Um, I'm just going to give you a few examples of projects that we're involved in. I'm, I'm going to use a couple small projects and one medium-sized project where our project partners are actually getting paid to reduce emissions. The first is Amco Farms in Leamington, Ontario. So southwestern Ontario, a greenhouse operator, and they've done a fuel switch. So they've switched uh, basically their, their source of fuel for heat to biomass, and that is, is primarily waste wood. That project generates roughly 65,000 tons uh, in reductions per year. Um, if you recall earlier, I was talking about the importance of a of regulated markets. So right now, if you look at what's happening in the voluntary space, prices per ton in North America vary between, you know, as low as $2 to maybe 8 or $9 per ton, just to give you a sense of what this means. In a regulated market, so in Alberta, for example, projects are trading between 10 and $15, basically. In Europe, where there have been much more robust systems in place, you know, carbon's traded anywhere between 15 euro to, you know, 30 to 40 euro in some cases. So it just gives you a sense, dollar-wise, if you're reducing this quantity of tons, what the potential might be. So back of the envelope, you can very quickly figure out how this can improve the economics of a project. Um, another pr project, uh, again, this, this one's maybe a little more on the smaller side and probably relevant to some of the forest industry companies up here. Uh, Sundance Forest Industries in Edson, which is uh, Western Alberta. They use wood waste on site to generate thermal energy. Um, it's primarily pine and spruce wood chips from their own operations. It's a project started just a few years ago. Generates about 13,000 tons per year in reductions. Again, smaller in size, but gives you a sense of, of some of the opportunities out there. Um, and then Tolco, this is a project in BC. It's a, uh, again, project that uses wood waste. Uh, and they're using a, a technology 
from a company based in Calgary that produces syngas. Reductions here about 8,500 tons per year. So why is, why is the offset market, why are offsets really, you know, relevant? What do you guys need to know uh, about carbon? I think there's a few things. First, ownership of reductions, and this is really important. For those of you that are currently suppliers of biomass or you're planning to be suppliers of biomass, we've had a number of companies approach us thinking that, you know, they've got a jackpot, they're going to get this big fat check for offsets. I think it's very important to set the expectation that typically the ownership or the title to the reductions associated with biomass typically reside with that company or the person who is actually consuming the fuel. So it's typically going to be the people that you are selling to, those who are actually consuming the biomass. So it's a very important distinction. Now, that being said, provided there's a strong carbon market in place and a strong carbon price, that's going to create additional demand for you because those people will want to buy more biomass. So it does indirectly help you. Um, secondly, smaller quantities of, of greenhouse gas reductions typically aren't enough. You know, if you're just talking about homeowners, typically don't produce or avoid enough greenhouse gases in a year to make sense for a project on its own. There are opportunities for aggregating a large number of those, uh, those, those smaller users into uh, a volume that makes sense, and we've had a lot of experience doing that. Um, but typically on their own, there's not enough. Suppliers, if you are supplying biomass, it's very, very important for you, both for your, your downstream purchasers, but also for yourself, to keep very good records about where your biomass is coming from. If you recall what I was talking about earlier around the avoided methane emission component of, of greenhouse gas reductions, if you have biomass that was destined to be uh, landfilled or burned, you've got to know where it's coming from. You've got to keep very, very good records. The quality of records will determine, uh, in large part, the quality of, of a potential project. So it's very, very important. Uh, for developers, if you have implemented a project to, uh, to uh, consume biomass uh, in the last few years, or if you're planning on doing it, keep very, very good records around what you had prior. So what equipment did you have prior? What fuel were you consuming? Because this is going to be very important in you actually maybe generating some funds from this and generating revenues. Um, and finally, um, in, in many cases, we've talked to a lot of people. In theory, it sounds simple. You've got a potential greenhouse gas reduction. A lot of people think it's very easy to turn those hypothetical reductions into someone actually giving you a check in your hand. Unfortunately, it is a quite a complex process. There's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of analysis. Uh, and unfortunately, there are, there are some lawyers involved to a certain degree. No offense to the lawyers in the crowd. Um, so it is complex. Um, Work with people who know what they're doing. Find people who actually have done this before, who've actually gotten uh, uh, people paid. And then se secondly, just be careful. There are a lot of people talking about carbon out there. If someone says something that sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So just use your good judgment. Um, finally, if I'll be here over the next two days. If you have any questions, you have a project opportunity, feel free to come by. We're happy to help and we'd love to see more projects happening in Northern Ontario. Thank you, merci.